FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. This episode of the Financial Survival Network is brought to you in part by Sandstorm Gold Royalties. Sandstorm Gold Royalties is a different kind of gold company. They purchase royalties on select mining operations and receive a percentage of the revenue in return. Sandstorm now has a portfolio of over 185 gold royalties around the world. See how gold royalties differ from other gold mining investments at sandstormgold.com. That's sandstormgold.com. Sandstorm Gold Royalties trades on the TSX as SSL and on the New York Stock Exchange American as SAND. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Today is January 3rd, 2018. Time moves on. Time waits for no man. As they say, well, you know, we got a lot going on in Washington. A new Democratic House taking control today. What are they going to do? Will they impeach Trump? All of that. And what about massive spending increases that they'd love to pull off? Hey, as always, we invite you to be a part of the show and email us, kl at kerrylutz.com. Well, our good friend Dan Greenfield is with us now. Always great to have you on the show. So, Daniel, welcome back. It's very much my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. So, Daniel, we got this uh, new house coming in, Democratic, uh, way more leftist than any other house we've ever seen, led by Nancy Pelosi, who is in the very loose control of her faculties, to put it charitably. We have a government mm-hmm. shutdown because Trump refuses to, to negotiate any longer on the wall. He wants it, and he won't take no for an answer. And Nancy won't take yes for an answer, and neither will Chuck Schumer. What is going to happen here? Well, right now, first of all, the Democrats are in the middle of a civil war in the House. Having won the House, they're now predictably battling each other over just how irresponsible and how extremist their governance is going to be. (laughs) Now, the shutdown, the Schumer shutdown, was very much calculated for the usual kind of Republican president, the kind that, like the past Republican presidents, would, of course, deal. Because, you know, the usual game is when Democrats are a majority in the in the House, in a sense, they get everything they want. When they're a minority, they still get most of everything they want because any kind of shutdown, um, Republicans will fear and avoid because they're going to be blamed for it because, of course, the media will always assign blame to the Republicans, no matter whether the Republicans are in control of Congress, whether they're in control of the White House, they're still going to be blamed for it. Uh, President Trump has upended this game plan by effectively calling their bluff which means he's gambling that the Democrats are ultimately going to be blamed for the shutdown by the public. And so far, it looks like the Democrats are actually picking up on that fear. And in any case, they're increasingly conflicted internally because there's a civil war between the so-called progressive caucus, the radicals, Mm -hmm. and Nancy Pelosi. Now, not all that long ago, Nancy Pelosi was the voice of the extreme left. The Democrats have moved so far left that Pelosi is now a moderate and is now involved in a conflict with people like Khan and Ocasio-Cortez. Yeah, so speaking of Alexandria Cortez, uh, Ocasio Cortez, I should say, ex- Alexandria Cortez Ocasio, uh, to say her name properly and give it the proper intonations. You know what's, what disturbs me about it? Lets people say, yeah, she's fringe, doesn't mean anything. I think she stands for the proposition that this, this generation of Americans have uh, now. Be- believe to become and practice stupidity as a virtue. I mean, the woman has nothing going on. She knows nothing. She has no historical perspective. She's basically stupid. And, you know, she doesn't even know what branch of government does what, but she supposedly makes a mean dish of macaroni and cheese. She's she's the millennials' last hope for equality and income equality and ending racism, all these wonderful things. In the meantime, she grew up in a uh, suburb of uh, Westchester County, about 10 miles from where I live, 12 miles, uh, very privileged, excellent schools, very safe, and she knows nothing about anything. Does, is this the future of the Democratic Party? Is this the future of the country? I couldn't have said it any better myself. 
Malachi, of course, this is very much a self-involved narcissist. She's a celebrity because she's a celebrity, and so she does everything possible to maximize her celebrity. She attracts attacks from Republicans in order to be able to play the victim. All these are very much narcissistic millennial traits, which is not to say that millennials are, as a generation, there's this kind of um, overgeneralization that all millennials yes. are basically a cause. Of course, there's no, she represents the worst of the generation. Um, she just managed to just to embody it in her totality. But and that is very much going to define the Democrats going forward because that is who they're attracting. They're attracting these professional privileged victims who don't actually know anything except that there's a virtue in being radical, but they don't even understand the radicalism that they're pushing. So the Democrats are going to get dumber and dumber and more and more radical. And Pelosi and the older guard, and really the Congress is now increasingly divided between the kind of really younger, dumb radicals, the Ocasio-Cortez crowd, and the people who are very much in their 70s, um, who are looking at this generation and going, what's coming after us? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I thought my generation was pretty screwed up, the baby boomers, and I definitely was screwed up in my day. But it's it's really disturbing here, Daniel, and and narcissism is, is a virtue, stupidity is a virtue, and, you know, it's just, it's, it's frightening. I don't see a way out of this uh, other than hopefully the millennials becoming self-aware at some point. And right now they couldn't be any further away from being self-aware than, than uh, perhaps Nancy Pelosi herself, who doesn't even remember who she is half the time. One of the major factors that's driving this kind of youthful radicalism is that it's taking longer and longer for each generation to grow up, and that's especially true of millennials who had a lot of helicopter parenting, which means they're only really coming into any kind of responsibility at best in their mid-20s, sometimes not even their 30s. Some of them are remaining just uh, perpetually marginally employed. Take Ocasio-Cortez was working as a bartender. They're working these kinds of fringe jobs. They're hanging out. They're not actually becoming adults, and that's mm -hmm. a basic problem because to become a conservative, you actually have to be an adult. You have to take responsibility. You have to pay taxes. You have to have yeah. the family and the uh, extensive hour work week. Otherwise, you just don't become an adult. And if you don't become an adult, there's no reason for you to be a conservative. Conservatism comes from the reality, the understanding that there are things worth protecting and that life is actually challenging, that the solutions aren't that simple, that you actually have to know what you're doing. And for this kind of generation, for the Kaiser Cortez crowd, none of those things apply. They're not adults. They haven't had to grow up. Uh, they've been lavished with attention just for being so special. And that's really the essence of Ocasio Cortez. She's so special because everybody's paying attention to her. The more attention they pay to her, the more special she must be. <laughs> yeah, you, you're, you're starting to depress me here, Daniel. But, you know, I can take solace in the fact that I've got three millennial children myself. They've all grown up extremely well, successful, responsible, although they do buy into this. They seem to not really have faith in the First Amendment, and they really believe that you have a constitutional right not to be offended. And that really, I find very disturbing. And I was having this discussion with my son, and he just didn't get it. He really didn't get it. Because millennials are very much driven by emotion rather than any kind of reason, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. The basic problem is that uh, we used to have class warfare. We used to have these economic debates. And, you know, that's really gone by the wayside. Increasingly, it's uh, debates about emotion, about being offended, about being hurt. The new victimization isn't uh, I'm economically deprived. It's not I'm oppressed. It's not I'm really segregated. It's that my feelings are being hurt. Yeah. So your feelings are hurt and the whole world is supposed to just stop and uh, <laughs> you know, it's where does this end here I guess is what I'm asking where does it end so some of this is really driven by the structure. If you think about millennials, this is really the first generation that grew up on the internet. They were defined right. by the internet. And it means that there's less socialization. There's less of a normal give and take. Instead, there's this sense that just as in the internet, I should be able to control what I see. Um, it should apply across the whole spectrum. I should be able to control whether my feelings are hurt or not. And a, a study showed this was a generation that's had less face-to-face -face contact socialization. Uh, most of the normal um, interactions, hanging out, um, dating are just the indicators for that are dropping, which means you have a generation that's increasingly shut in into their mobile devices. And so they have less capacity and tolerance for having their feelings hurt. Mm -hmm. 
thing. So, but you think they're going to mature? Because like you said, they are taking longer. Each generation is taking longer. I mean, my parents, my goodness, my father was off to war at 20 years old. He was married, had a child on the way. And me, I didn't get married, have children till mid 20s. Now it's 30, early 30s. And, you know, how do we help them grow up faster? Is, is a crash, is a major disaster, economic disaster, going to help you grow up faster? One of the major things that we just zoom in on is the entire educational complex. Uh, it used to be you graduated high school, you went to work, maybe you went to college. Now it's college is standard, which means four years of delaying adulthood. Then on top of that, you have the people who are going to grad school, which means years more of delaying adulthood. And the basic reality is that the longer you're in school, the longer it's going to take you to get out into the workplace, to start a family, to actually have any idea of what life is really like. And so you actually see the people who go to grad school are far more likely to be on the left. The people who go to college are somewhat less likely, but still more likely than the average person to be on the left. Now, some of this is political indoctrination, but some of this is just a failure to grow up because you're constantly, you're still in school. You're in your mid twenties, you're still in school. Yeah. So it's kind of like the, uh, Peter Pan, uh, syndrome, right? I'll never grow up. I'll never grow up. And yes, the longer you stay in school, the longer you get to put off all of that, you know, but I don't know the the uh, greatest generation. Many of many of you out there didn't go to college, and yet you pushed all of your children to go to college regardless. And you know now college is is enshrined in some kind of mystique that you and I agree, both agree, Daniel. It doesn't belong there. It does not. It's a higher education bubble. It's creating completely insane, unsustainable debt, both on the national level, we're talking trillions of dollars, and both on the individual level. Uh, students are coming out of uh, college with a completely worthless degree and hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. It's in a completely unsustainable situation. And this is why, of course, the Democrats are pushing free college for everybody. This was already 2016. Um, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders got behind making college basically universal and free, even though it adds absolutely nothing um, for most people in most professions. And I say that as a college graduate who have a, <laughs> and I have a completely worthless degree. Um, so many students are actually going through the system. They don't understand really um, what that implies, their parents don't understand it. They end up with huge amounts of student debt and a degree that basically is worthless. And really the function of a college degree at this point is the equivalent of the old high school degree, which is basically that you're capable of basic responsible behavior. You you have basic literacy. And even that's not even assured anymore with a college degree, which is why employers are increasingly want MAs. They increasingly want higher degrees. And then we end up in the same situation as Europe, where you have a whole bunch of people in their early 30s who have multiple degrees and no employment options. Yeah, that is a great point. And we, it's an undeniable trend here. We've definitely seen this uh, really take off over, over the past couple of decades. And I guess, um, you know, what's interesting also is when we look at the structure of the economy, uh, this generation's poo-pooed manufacturing and manual labor, you know, welders, I have a, sh a show that I consult with uh, manufacturing talk radio. Welders are are basically starting out uh, after they finish their apprenticeship, eighty thousand a year and up. And you know, a welder, there's nothing wrong with being a welder. You know, the crash of manufacturing is a major crisis, and it's one of those really issues that propelled President Trump to the top because he actually addressed what was going on in this country. And when you take out manufacturing from the picture, and you know manufacturing used to be a way for people to be able to actually get a good middle-class yeah. life, and now that actually segments the economy, you have the people at the very top who can be working in Silicon Valley, and then what's left are these service industry jobs where you're basically working at McDonald's and waiting to be replaced um, by an automated system. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. I call them uh, kiosk casualties. So you're losing your job to a kiosk. You're a casualty of the kiosk and capital investment. And look, it's always better to have a machine than an individual doing the same job if the machine can truly do it. And we're seeing more and more and then AI coming in replacing people's mm -hmm. minds as well. So should you be negative about the future here, Daniel, or what's the hope here? Where do we find hope? Well, 
you know, the future, the present, the past, all of them have their pros and cons. It's important to see that. It's important to see how we can ride that. So a lot of the infrastructure of today, the social, the political, economic infrastructure is headed for a major crash. The Internet has fundamentally upended life in ways that we haven't even properly come to terms with. What we've been discussing is a kind of a shallow dip in the pool. It's transformed life generationally. It's transformed things economically. But the good thing about a crash is that it actually forces us to adapt. It destroys a lot of the rot infrastructure that's been holding us back. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're seeing. Um, the uh, we've been seeing that with President Trump in the political um, arena, just because a lot of the old infrastructure, the political infrastructure, had been rotten through. It was diluted by hypocrisy, by assorted corrupt deals. Um, we'd become used to a politics where nobody meant what they actually said. And mm -hmm. so a lot of the chaos now, a lot of what people are calling the rise of extremism is basically the rise of a politics in which people actually mean what they say, in which voters reward politics politicians who are authentic. And obviously yeah. this is very traumatic. In some ways, it's very traumatic for the people who are in the business of politics. And yet at the same time, it has its rewards. Yeah. And we're going to see that across the various sectors of the economy. The authentic, the things that it can actually be sustained, that can stand on their own, are going to rise. Uh, a lot of infrastructure, the hypocrisy, the vaporware, um, the transparently phony things that we've come to believe that companies have come to adapt and accept, mm -hmm. a lot of that is going to collapse. And, you know, out of the ashes is going to rise the next big thing. And we're going to have to be on that. Yeah. So, so right now, Trump, he's dealing with an adversarial Congress from both parties. Let's face it, the uh, Republicans have no love for him, although we've got a lot more Republicans in office now who are no longer deep state rhino moles. But what's going to happen? Uh, they, you think they're going to bother to try to uh, impeach the president? Uh, do they have to do that to appease their base, the Democrats? Or is something else going to happen that we're totally surprised about? The Democrats have been promising their base to impeach Trump at this point forever. They're going to have to try to deliver on it. That's the what I call it is the equivalent of the repeal Obamacare for Republicans. Republicans have been promising this, even though they had no intention of actually doing this forever. <laughs> so they had to try to do it. And at the same time, they flubbed it. So I think the Democrats are going to put on a similar effort that's going to look somewhat plausible, but at the same time, is ex they're expected to fail. And their base is going to be furious to them the same way that conservatives are furious at Republicans for actually not repealing Obamacare. Hey, that's such a great point. You make some really excellent points. So you heard we weren't planning on talking about Obamacare, but you heard that this judge declared it unconstitutional and then he put out a uh, clarifying opinion that looks pretty darn bulletproof. And it's interesting because I never count on the, on the courts to save us because they never do. But uh, this judge, uh, he makes some pretty uh, strong arguments, doesn't he? He certainly does. And, you know, we knew all along that Obamacare was unconstitutional. The case against it is reasonably straightforward. The larger problem, of course, is the Supreme Court previously had a chance to take a position on that, and the position that they took was we're not going to challenge the executive in this regard. Mm -hmm. So I think we can expect them to do that all over again. The basic reality is expecting Republicans on the court, conservatives on the court, um, a majority of whom to hold the ground on issues like this is unrealistic, and yeah. that's unfortunate. Yeah, so you don't think they're going to, you think it's going to go back to the Supreme Court and they're just going to say, hey, it's the law of the land and that's it? Effectively, yes. They might not put it quite in those terms, but they're basically going to find an excuse the same way they found an excuse when the whole uh, mandate issue came to them last time around. So I don't think they're going to take a stand on it because they don't have the courage of their convictions. When you get leftists in the Supreme Court, they will deliver pretty much 90 percent of the time. When you have conservatives on the court, and I'm, I mean, there are two groups of conservatives, I would say. There are people like Justice Thomas, who is 100 percent, but there are people on the court who are going to deliver maybe 50 percent of the time. They're not going to do anything that upends the status quo too much. That's going to be too scary. That's going to lead to too many protests against them. At this point, the basic reality of Obamacare is that people have come to accept it. Um, so many of the people originally opposed Obamacare because it upended their insurance, but now Obamacare is their insurance and they're opposed to upending it. So really Republicans in the Congress have no conviction about repealing it. Um, they're willing to let it die on its own and maybe prop it up in some ways. And I mm -hmm. don't expect Republicans on the Supreme Court or conservative justices on the Supreme Court um, to go to the wall on this either. Huh. Yeah, well, it's nice to hope. <laughs> nice to dream, but I'm, I'm inclined to yeah. agree with you. Well, anyway, Daniel, I appreciate your coming on. Appreciate, hopefully 
2019 will be an amazing year for most of us and will do well. Hey, uh, where's the best place to find your work these days? I'm a showman journalism fellow with the David Harwood Freedom Center. So I'm largely found on their website, frontpagemag.com, along with a lot of other great writers and investigative journalists. All right. Hey, well, it's always great to have you in. Any questions or comments, be a part of the show and write us kl at kerrylutz.com. About 100 emails behind. I have to catch up from the New Year's. I was partying a little too hardy and uh, kind of neglected you, but I will be on the case shortly. And look, uh, if you're listening to this on YouTube, please subscribe, like, and share. If you're listening through other means, podcasts, etc., share the show. It really helps me when you do it. I really need your help to get the word out. Intellectual debate. That's what we're all about here. Don't forget the Twitter feed at Carrie Lutz. And hey, we will be talking to you again real soon there, Mr. Greenfield. Appreciate you coming on. Looking forward to it. Thank you again. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.